Okay, so here we have two very good questions. Both of these questions are about sampling distributions, and they're about sampling distributions of the proportion. So before I get into them, I want to um, make a few comments, okay? Whenever we are talking about sampling distributions, remember that this is a very theoretical idea, okay? It's, it's talking about the idea of the central limit theorem, the idea of, hey, if I look at this summary data, um, generally it's an average, but when we're talking about pr proportions, we start talking about proportions as, you know, p hats, right? But in the original uh, founding of that, of that central limit theorem idea, we're talking about averages and we're saying, hey, that consistency between the summary data, not the individual data, the summary, the average, if it's an average we're talking about, that's going to line up and be very, very consistent. Right? If it were if it were averages, again, it would have been the sample statistics of those averages. So every single time I'm if I if I want a visualization of a sampling distribution, what I'm imagining is I'm stacking up some summary value in a histogram or up under a bell curve, right? The histogram would create a bell curve if all the criteria has been met. Now, sampling distributions about proportions. are a step uh, more fancy because there's two things that happen. First, you have the idea of what the heck is a proportion, right? A proportion is this thing where we see success, failure, or yes, no. Two outcomes, right? And so I already see in question number three where the binomial is on your mind because it should be. We're, we're talking success, failure. We're talking two outcomes. And we know um, there's some history here in how we get even to the binomial. We know that we have, in my spelling, let me see if I can get the spelling here, Bernoulli. We know, um, and if you don't, I'm telling you now, uh, we have something called Bernoulli's distribution. And that's actually when you start off in the, in the original state of just looking like, let's say we, we were just uh, saying, hey, what's the, what's the probability that I get, um, you know, uh, one jelly bean over another, right? So the probability of yes versus no, right? So in this example, if I wanted to draw the Bernoulli, let me, let me change it. For this example being question two, this is just uh, something kind of cool for me to show you, okay? Uh, this literally is just like success versus failure. And I would be saying, hey, look, well, my probability of success for my, um, I could probably just say success. We don't usually look at a whole lot of these, but the idea is it's going to be at 25%. That's my likelihood of the success, right? My likelihood of not getting a pink jelly bean, that's going to be at 75%, right? So Bernoulli just straight up says, hey, what's the likelihood? Um, and it could have been constructed by some kind of empirical data where you've tallied it up to see what that pattern was for yes and no. But the journey goes on, right? The journey goes on into binomial. And so a lot of the questions I see coming out of this question have to do with theory for question two and question three about why am I crossing that bridge and why wouldn't I kind of go the other way? Uh, that's at least in question three, very transparent to me. So with the binomial, that's the first little bridge that we cross when we say, okay, well, I don't just care about a single time, right? I care about several times happening. I want several trials to occur. So with binomial, we have N independent trials, and we still have this idea of P and Q, where P is still success and Q is still failure, right? And the binomial um, starts to say, okay, well, I'm actually going to count. Instead of just saying straight up what's the likelihood of yes or no like Bernoulli, I'm going to count the number of successes. I'm going to keep up with that. Okay. And so Bernoulli, or excuse me, binomial starts off by doing that. You know, hey, look, what's the likelihood of exactly no success? Exactly one yes, or one pink jelly bean. Exactly two pink jelly beans. Exactly three, on and on, right? And so it would start off with, um, I don't know, whatever that distribution might look like. I have no idea without doing some kind of simulation here. So we'll just make this up right now, okay? Um, and it will it will change my expectation of how many how many zero you know how many times would I would I have you know do this many trials and get 
or excuse me, um, would, I, would I look at this many jelly beans and get a no versus a yes or whichever example you're looking at, the, the height of these bars will change based on the number of trials, which probably makes sense, right? I mean, if I have five jelly beans, it might be more likely, the bar might be taller on the likelihood of not getting any pink ones at all if we want to go to the jelly bean example. But if I had 100 jelly beans, this bar right here, uh, it, it may go down because, hey, we have 100 jelly beans. It's going to be less likely that I get none pink. There's 100 of them, right? Well, in that idea that these bars can change in height when my sample size gets larger or smaller is the idea that binomials, whenever I have a nice enough balance, and the balance that most statisticians deem as nice enough is bigger than or equal to 10 when you multiply n times p and n times q. Some statisticians will say 5, and I know for us mathy type people it drives us crazy to hear anything different, but usually 10 is the safest place to be, okay? Um, because uh, 10 is what we usually use when we're looking at inference for that nice little prereq when we're checking. So with this right here, how times we say, you know what, if I multiply my, my number of trials multiplied by my likelihood of yes and likelihood of no, what I will notice, just like when I said 100 right there, and I said, well, the likelihood of getting a zero is lower, right? I will notice that the bars start to kind of change in their balance, right? It gets to where I start to get more of a bell shape. And so it's like a golden ticket right here where over here in question three, it looks like you're asking, hey, well, why wouldn't I just use a binomial, right? I understand it's yes, no stuff. We're talking proportions. Why would I ever go ahead and look at a sampling distribution? And the answer is, well, it gives you a lot more power to go on to do inference. That's the entire purpose of this material here is to say, you know what? I can take this binomial. I can, I can cross another bridge. So from Bernoulli to binomial, to cross another bridge into normal. And once I've crossed that bridge, it's the best day ever because I'm sitting so much closer to that idea of central limit theorem that I already briefly discussed with the X bars, right? Except, of course, we're saying P hat because it's proportions, but it's still summary data or summary information. You could call it statistics, right? Summary statistics. So keep this in the back of your mind, and now let's go back to these problems. Remember the theory here and what we're trying to work for, and we're wanting the power that the central limit theorem gives us. That power of saying, I don't really care what the original balance looks like. I'm going to change my question from individual, and I'm going to say for summarizing you know, the entire group. What's that characteristic? What's that average or what's that percent for the entire group? So it makes it much more consistent and it guarantees us the bell shape. Central limit theorem should be just like in your mind right now, just wonderfully large. You're thinking this is the coolest thing ever. We have reached a place where we can start to make inference. We can rely on a bell curve and we don't even care what the parent population looks like. I mean, if it was already a beautiful parent population, well, great. That means we can do less work to fix it. But quite frankly, as long as you meet the prereqs and get a big enough sample size, you're good to go anyway. And even the pretty ones get prettier as your sample size increases. That's the theory. Hold on to that, okay? Now, let's go in here and look at some of the details because I do see in question number two what's bothering you. You have a right to be bothered. It used to bother me actually when I was studying statistics because this – what this inconsistency that you are seeing, this came out of a test generator, and maybe it's good that it's there because it literally is in like every stats book that I have ever looked at. This tends to be something, I think, I'm not really sure why they treat it so casually and change the words with the 100 bags versus 100 jelly beans in each bag. Um, I do know with the theory, it really makes no difference. So maybe that's why. I don't, I don't know if there's more to it than that. It is a very common to see this though. So let's talk about what you're seeing and why it's okay and why it changes nothing about the problem, okay? I'm with you. I like to imagine things when I read. So I see here you say, hey, I imagine this is thousands of bags. Okay, well, actually, I mean, it should be way more. You're right, thousands, maybe, maybe even like, hundreds of thousands or more, right? I mean, I, they probably make lots and lots of jelly bean bags in their, you know, wherever they manufacture all this stuff. So you're right. They're claiming some truth here. And we know that in the real world, that means there's lots and lots of bags that should be following this truth. And their claim is that the true balance is 25% of the time, yes, we have pink, okay? Suppose that the candies are packaged at random. That's good. I'm glad they're not, you know, pre-rigging that or we mess everything up since we must have random and independent to even have a conversation here. 
Um, and they're, they're random, they're in small bags containing about 100 jelly beans. So this right here is key. I love how you circled that because you are right. My sample size of what's in each bag, I'm gonna say I have 100 jelly beans in each bag, okay? That's the key here in being able to say, can I use the, the can I treat this like a sampling distribution and use the features that we've learned about, okay? So a class of students opens several bags. Again, I'm still with you because I'm a very, visual person so I'm like you where I'm like okay well I get maybe there's thousands of bags or 10,000 or millions or who cares you know I don't know how big this company is lots of bags out there in the world and 25% of them um, or 25% of the, the, the jelly beans are gonna be pink in those bags that's beautiful but then it's like it tells us several bags it does not tell us anything about the number of bags they're opening again this is very common usually the problems are not going to try to compete with you and say how many bags exactly so they're being sloppy with the numbers, and that sloppiness is also common. Uh, they're being sloppy, but I want you to remember that the theory, as we're down here talking about sampling distributions, let me give us a theory with some p-hats under it. The theory is not finite. I'm not saying, please sample 100 bags. No one cares. Right? I'm not saying sample 10,000, sample 1,000, because the theory here where we're not only taking a binomial and making it normal, but the theory that, that normal distributions can go into is the central limit theorem where I start to say, go back to that theorem, it is so crucial, as my sample size approaches infinity. And so there is this blurring of lines where here, when we're talking about sample size, my n has the meaning of how many different groups did you have, right? But up here in the problem, our interest when we're proving is we start to say n is individual bags. And the reason some of that blurring is okay is because, well, the theory here is that that n down here on the bottom, this one's going to infinity because I'm talking in theory about if I could repeat this and I could collect all the bags I wanted over and over and over and over, what would the pattern be? In practice, no one is going to go out there and collect probably not even a thousand bags. I don't, maybe a hundred, I don't know. Usually what will happen is uh, we will get a sufficient sample size and we will say, okay, well, there's my one sufficient sample size. Does it have the characteristics? So what I'm trying to tell you is no one really cares how much was in each bag or how many bags you had. All we care is you have enough jelly beans to talk about the true balance. And that's part of why they're being a little bit blurry around the lines here, okay? You need to know what that sample size is that you're plugging in. But in real practice, whether you had to open lots of little mini Halloween bags of jelly beans, those little bitty, the mini ones that you always want to eat more of, at least I do, or you, or you have a giant one, right? Um, no matter how many of those you actually had to open to get that, that number in your sample size, no one actually cares, okay? As long as you got a hold of this stuff randomly and it's independent. So, in real practice, we usually think of it as just being a one-time big group of information, big big sample. So we focus on the fact that, that we have 100 jelly beans somehow at our disposal, okay? And, that's, and all the bags contain it. Um, so you are right. Uh, I mean, this right here suggests each bag has one jelly bean in it. No one cares how many bags you had to open to get your 100 jelly beans. Don't let that bug you. Know that it happens a lot with the wording here because they're able to be kind of uh, less formal with the words to focus on the theory. But the idea is how many jelly beans do you have at the end of the day? You have 100. There you go. Okay? And you're falling into this theory that yes, you could have repeated this many, 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 many times. And down here's the shape you would have gotten. Well, if the prerequisites were met, right? That's why it goes on to say, well, there's your information. Now is it appropriate to use a normal model? And so I see part two, where, um, where we kind of move from the whole, this 100's getting on my nerves, which again, no one cares how many bags they actually opened to get their jelly beans. We just know they have 100 jelly beans, okay? Um, but beyond that, you start asking me, okay, why? Why is the first answer the only correct one? So let's, let's use some elimination here, and then we'll go back to the longer one at the top that's correct. Okay, so first, let's take a look at this one right here. A normal model is not appropriate. Wait a second. First of all, 
a normal model is definitely appropriate. We literally just talked about the theory over here for binomial turning to normal, and we said that n times p, n times q, if that's bigger than or equal to 10 for both, that our picture started to turn normal. That's in the theory, even without a sampling distribution, that's in the theory of the shape of that binomial that we would expect. It, it crosses the bridge. It can now be looked at as normal in our calculations, right? So, okay, yeah, you this one right here, no. Model, it, it is appropriate. We, it is, we know that it's appropriate. Um, now, I think this is the one that actually addresses success failure. So I'll cross that one off first because it says not, and it specifically goes to the thing that I would have first talked about, which is that right there, being greater than or equal to 10. And it is greater than or equal to 10. So again, that's invalid. This one up here says, hey, we violate something else. Remember, our principles are must be random, must be independent, do not exceed 10% of your population. Success failure, that's what gives you the bell shape on that, right? Success failure gave me that bell shape. Um, the other ones were giving you central limit theorem effect. And then um, we also have, what's the, is there another one? Maybe that's all of them. I think it is. Okay. Um, so 10%, uh, well, okay, we have 100 jelly beans. We got them somehow. We don't know how many bags, even though they drove us crazy and tried to tell us a number of bags. We know there's 100 jelly beans in our presence. Is that more than 10% of the jelly beans in the world? Please tell me it's not, because there better be more than 1,000 jelly beans out there in the population of wherever it is we're studying, the USA, I guess, something, right? So again, the, these two right here are, are not good. Uh, normal model is appropriate because samples are random and in independent. Nice, I do agree with you, thank you. Also, the sample size is 100, and it's less than 10%. Also, nice. Agreeing, agreeing. This looks like my competitor in the, in the question, you know. Multiple choice loves to have that one to take your attention. Read the last sentence. Most importantly, they, like, flag this for you. The original population has a normal... Say what? My original population? Um... We're talking here about sampling distributions, right? I'm talking about looking at a whole group. And if I looked at groups of that size over and over and over, um, I would get this nice normal distribution. I have no idea what the original population looks like based on this problem. I mean, I have a suspicion just outside of this problem uh, from seeing many, many other candy type problems in the world. It, normally manufacturers will claim that they have a uniform distribution actually, just for the record in case you're curious. Usually they would like to tell you, hey, the number of pinks is the same as the number of whatever else, green I guess, or whatever else you got going on in this bag of jelly beans is the same as the number of white. Usually they want to show you a uniform distribution where all those bars are actually not bell-shaped. Usually the true parent population would be uh, uniform if you're looking at all the individual colors, right? And we know that on this one, if we were looking at pink or not pink from our lovely little Bernoulli down there, that is also not a bell shape. So no, we're not relying on anything normal from the beginning, right? Even if we went towards the binomial, uh, I mean, I guess at that point, because we have added to this no longer individual, we've added to this the idea of groupings. Now we start to say, with that many trials, okay, now I can consider normal. But we are already so far into heading towards that central limit theorem philosophy. We're no longer talking one jelly bean. What's the population of, that, of, of jelly beans in general? We're talking groups now, trials, right? counting up those successes. What's happening? What's my pattern? So, yeah, no. Uh, it could have been in a perfect world. In this case, I really don't think it was uh, normal. But that's the beauty of the theory that we're using here. The beauty is that we're saying the parent population can be any shape. You know, it could have been uniform. It could have been skewed. It could have been bimodal. Who cares? I mean, when I start kicking in the central limit theorem, the whole idea is that I do not look at individual values. I look at summary values. I have this entire group of 100. What is that one value that summarizes this group of 100? What is my p hat? 
Now let's do it again in theory. We're not really going to do it again. But let's go get another group of 100, right? Summarize the 100. Don't tell me about those individuals. Summarize. And again, those summary statistics, that's what's giving us the bell shape. Uh, I mean, if it started off bell shape with individuals, that's fine and dandy. It's just going to get prettier. But the idea is that's not a most important. That, that's actually, we don't even, as long as you have a good enough sample size, we're good to go. Move beyond that. Because we know that it's going to turn everything into a nice shape eventually as n approaches infinity. What? And here they contradict themselves. I guess they're, they're trying to get us to think about that the population distribution is not normal. Actually, it probably isn't. You're right. Uh, we really don't care, though, as long as we meet the criteria for this, uh, for sampling distributions, for this to kick in, right? So the normal mode is not appropriate. Well, no, it is appropriate. Okay. It's appropriate because, oh, here, let's read it. It's a random sample. Beautiful, right? Fewer than 10% of the population. I agree, yes. Look, I'm greater than or equal to 10 in my balance. So that tells me that it should actually have that nice bell shape. Okay. So on the question, you do have a very valid point, And it comes up again and again in stats questions where there's this kind of like um, fuzziness between what are they calling in, right? Are they saying in as I did this that many times or I opened that many bags? The idea for you as a student is to remember the theory, first of all, is that these groups would have been collected so many times you couldn't count, infinitely many times. And when they're giving you a sample size, even if they try to change kind of how they say it, when they're giving you a sample size, you think of that as how many of that item do I have in my possession. I have 100 jelly beans. I do not care how many bags I had to get 100 jelly beans. They can tell me it took me 100 bags to open and get 100 jelly beans. No one cares. It could have been one bag of 100 jelly beans. And so I, I see your concern. Just don't get hung up there because I'm telling you it's a very common uh, thing. And I suspect that maybe there's some purpose. Uh, it's a very common thing to see when you're reading these problems. Focus on the main theory. What do you have? And is it, is it a valid sample that you have in your hand? Right? Because, it's, you know, come on. You're not actually going to have infinitely many or you'd have the whole population, you know, you, you, well, you wouldn't even have. I need to stop talking right there. Okay. Let's move on to question number three. Um, here it looks like you, you have the right idea. You're saying, um, let's see, what are you saying? You're saying that you're, you, it looks like you're confused between binomial versus normal. Okay. And you're saying, why is this the only accepted answer? You are correct here. It looks like you've done some homework on the fact that you know that binomial is the yes, no, the thing that we discussed down here already. And you also know the way to represent that distribution. That looks nice. You are right. Um, we could say n times p where n's trials and p is the percent, okay? But why do we move this way is your question. Why do we go down here at the end? Well, first of all, this one is kind of just in the directions. You know, you actually could have not crossed the bridge and said, I'm going to stay with binomial and describe that. Now, in real life, just for the record, you would never do that. In real life, you want to cross the bridge. You want to describe the normal if you can. In fact, you want to do what the directions are saying here and talk about, um, look, sampling distribution model. And that's how you know that you can't, in this particular problem, stick with the binomial. This, even though it is true for um, the problem, if, it, if we were not talking about a sampling distribution, this is binomial by nature, right? Um, we had 200 in our sample. 40% of the time, um, they are what they're preferring a finished basement, right? But we're not asking about, you know, each person, what do they prefer? That 40%, oh, whoops. That 40% is each person. That is not what I get after going over here to the theory that we've learned about with sampling distributions where we know that if we start off normal, it gets more narrow, and if it's not normal, it becomes normal eventually, right? We have different formulas for that. So let's see. Let's write down what we've got. You've already kind of suggested that you know that P, um, just because you wrote this and you see that it matches that, that um, P is equal to 40% uh, yes for finished basement. My sample size is a group of 200. Okay. And when we are describing this, 
uh, again, we're going to have to take into account my sample size of 200 um, in the group and, 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 and make it normal because we're talking sampling distribution. We're talking, this is a sampling distribution right here. This over here, that is not a sampling distribution. We would not clap, we would not, we wouldn't call it that. Okay, so it's in what the question's asking you. And also in the fact that in real life, you want to, you want to cross this bridge if you can anyway. But, but the question actually uh, asks you for this model. So with this, we know that it's a normal model. Okay, and when we describe normal models, we always describe their, um, their mean. Actually, let me change that. Uh, mean, and we always describe uh, their standard deviation. If we have to use sample data, we'll change standard deviation and call it standard error. Um, with this right here, we're talking in theory and we're acting like we already know the truth of 40%, so we can still call it um, standard deviation like that. Okay, and whenever we're going between a proportion, uh, you know, that binomial and crossing over into normal land, we know a few things. We know, for example, that the mean, here, the mean will always be clustering around that true P. So what I'm saying is, let's go back over here. In theory, oops, all of these samples, if they're awesome, wonderful samples, like we're saying when they meet the criteria, we hope they are, uh, they're going to be clustering the most. We know the point of center on a bell curve, or the, the place of the most tendency is going to be uh, the mean or the median or the mode, they're all stacked in the center on a bell curve or very close to the center. Um, that's going to be my P, right, on the picture. It's going to be stacking up close to the truth. All my little sample percents that I find in my groups should start stacking pretty close to the truth. That's the power of the sampling distribution as it clusters around the truth. So the mean on my picture, the center is P. Now, the standard deviation, there's different ways to write it. I, I think for you all, I may have tried to write it kind of easy, but it's, um, it's P times Q over N. I may have written it for you guys, P times one minus uh, P instead of Q. But the idea is that we do have to take into account that this picture is no longer an original picture. A sampling distribution is saying, I'm looking at P hats. I'm looking at summary data. And in doing that, I have a new modified standard deviation, just like I would have when I was dealing with, with the means. Remember, with the means, it would have been x bar divided by this, or excuse me, uh, it would have been mu, and then uh, for the x bar distribution, let me write it so, so I don't say it and mess it all up. It would be approximated by the normal, with mu as the mean, and you take the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. That's the other one. The one that we're looking at here, I'm telling you, is that p hat, is described by a normal distribution where p is the mean and where you have the square root of p times q over n as your standard deviation. Okay, let's check this real quick. I haven't actually, I didn't pre-check this before right now. So 40% for sure is the p. We got that. We see that on this one and this one actually. Now let's double check. Um, we should have the square root of 40% times 60% over 200. And I, it took me forever on the calculator. I apologize. I wanted to make sure that I was typing everything in correctly. I'm getting 3.464, um, and it keeps keeps going. In, in the smallest decimal form, this right here is actually equal to 0 0.03464, on and on. And then uh, if you move the decimals to follow suit with the fact that they have percents showing in their answers, that's what you get. I'm trying to figure out where they got that 1.7. The best I can figure is that they didn't square root, maybe, 
or because even if the person, even if you knew, um, or maybe they tried to do, I'm not sure, um, without going into it more, but hopefully this right here explains a little bit about what's going on and uh, good questions. This is some really important stuff. I'm glad you care enough to ask.